Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by our friends at Y Charts. Michael, a few weeks ago, we discussed some conflicting stats. Either we had to have a recession to bring inflation down, or the stock market had retraced more than 50% of its gains, and that's never happened before where it's gone back to a new low. So it's kind of like something has to give here. Well, something did give very quickly because the stock market just turned right around and now as of the close on Monday was down 23.8%. And I got the, the drawdown chart on Y charts here. I like how you can draw the minimum level. You can do the lows and the highs and the average. So I put the low in here. 23.8% is the new current largest drawdown in this bear market cycle. It took out the June lows just by a smidge. And we're there. It happened very quickly. Thoughts? Mm. I agree with everything you said. Well, I didn't really say anything spectacular. I, I just I just gave you some data. <laughs> I agree with the data. We're going to have itself. some thoughts. We're gonna, I mean, we're yeah, have come th- on. Save my thoughts for the show. We'll have some thoughts on this show. Anyway, if you want to try to do another drawdown chart like us on Y Charts, go to Y Charts, tell them Animal Spirit sent you, and they'll give you 20% off that initial subscription when you sign up. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Michael, Jerome wait, Powell wants you to- Wait. What? We got to timestamp this. I feel like we don't, we don't do a good job timestamping the shows because people don't know when we record. So it is Tuesday, 1148 Eastern time. The market opened up higher this morning and we're now at the lows of the day. Okay, proceed. Thanks for that piece of news there. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> this is 24 hours stale by the time this goes out. All right. Uh, Jerome Powell wants people to lose their jobs. This is from his quotes last week when he talked. You know, we're never going to say that there are too many people working, but the real point is inflation, and you can whatever the rest he said, but he's basically saying, we're not saying we want you to lose your job, but we're not not saying it. And then someone asked him, how long, well, how long is it going to take for this pain? He said, how long? It really depends on how long it takes wages and more than that, prices to, for inflation to come down. So he's, he's still putting his foot on the, the brakes or the gas pedal, one or the other. Depends which way you're looking here. Here's my problem. Hang on, so, hang on, hang on. No, it doesn't. He's putting what? his foot on the brakes. Stop moving yeah, your brakes, mic. Right. Brakes. Sorry, I'll just get in. Okay, so here's my problem with the way that Powell and the Fed are acting right now. And I, I've been in, people have called me a Fed apologist in the past. The last few months I've been dissenting. At this point, I think the Fed is nuts. So gas prices are down, commodity prices are down, stocks are crashing, bonds are crashing. The house, housing market is broken. We're going to get into that later. Mortgage rates have more than doubled. Do you think maybe we pause for a minute and just see what happens here instead of just breaking the economy's neck? Like instead, this like you're standing at the top of a cliff, and you see these stairs over here, and you go, "We could take the stairs to the bottom. It might take a while, but we'll do it." Instead, the Fed is just pushing you off of a cliff for the U.S. economy and saying, "Sorry, we're not going to wait. We don't want to wait for, wait for you to take those stairs. We're going to push you off." I mean, the fact that they're just they want people to lose their jobs and wages to go down just seems insane to me. It's like they don't even want to see what a soft landing looks like. I think, from their point of view, I don't think Jerome Powell would ever say this out loud. But he's a human being, just like the two of us, and it appears that he's overcorrecting for the mistake that he made, assuming that inflation was transitory, which we made that mistake as well. But guess what? We're not running the we're not running the central bank. So and there was here's not, the thing. Wait, like re- wait, recovering from wait, what? Who? I was trying. I was. Can I finish my point? Okay. Can, can I finish? Can I? Yes. <laughs> uh, Remember that so I think one that Dana Carvey did a uh, Ross Perot back in the day. <laughs> Yeah. Might have been before your time. No, no, no. I, I do remember Danny Carvey very well. Uh, okay, so overcorrecting. Overcorrecting for a past mistake is number one. Number two, I think that they are talking deadly serious about the fact that they want to bring inflation down. I don't know at all costs, but at least at most costs. And they are willing to trade broken markets, pain in the economy, for bringing down inflation. I think that they think that that is the worst, the worst of two evils. I just, at I least just that's how they're talking. The that's how they're talking. It is. It, but I think like there's a difference between recovering from a bear market in stocks or bonds. That to me, that's fine. Those things will co- recover eventually. But the fact that they, they want millions of people to potentially lose their job just seems well, insane. Well, that's what a recession that, is. They're, they're, they're trying to destroy demand. So that's what they're listen, doing. Listen, a recession, like that's a natural part of our system. But I don't know why you wouldn't want to remove one of, one of those if you could help it. Like, I don't know why you'd do that. On per- like, look at the wage I, I think numbers. that the, what they're saying is that they, we can't bring down inflation without destroying demand. It's very simple. Like, it's it's the, the people on the, lar- the lowest end of the wage scale are making the most money now, or they're get, seeing the biggest increase in wages. I don't see why 
that happens for 18 months and you decide we have to just get rid of it. So here's here's Colin Roche. He's been writing really good on this lately. On the one hand, I understand that they want to be certain this isn't the 1970s. On the other hand, I don't think this is very similar to the 70s and that they're now creating a lot more downside economic risk than they think. That's what I think too. Mortgage rates are at 7%. Listen, again, every financial markets have already crashed. Why not just say, you know, we've we've already done a lot. We've we've probably had the biggest increase in 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 interest rates from the Fed cycle like in the quickest amount of time ever. Why don't we just pause? Because here's the thing. They have this dual mandate of price stability and employment, right? So after 2020 and 2021, they said employment is the only thing we're focusing on. Now they say inflation is the only thing we're focusing on. Maybe just be a little more balanced is my problem with what the Fed is doing instead of just going from one extreme to the other and making things just like the cycles are just, it's, it's just like water sloshing around in a bathtub in both directions. Yeah, so I don't disagree with anything that you're saying. Uh, I think I think this was the week that uh, everyone agreed that whoa, what are you doing? This and, and we'll get to that in a second. But if I'm just putting my if I'm just putting my J Pow hat on, which has much more hair than I do, I would say that he's thinking I can't say that, Ben. Because if I say that, the market will scream and all of the work that we're trying to do will be undone in 30 days or less. Because at the last, the last time I spoke even relatively easy, and that wasn't even easy, the market totally misinterpreted me. And so I think that, I think that a part of him probably would like to do that. But I, don't, I think what he's afraid of is backing off and then all of the hard work that they've done gets unwound. Do you think that is, is a- probably – do you think that, that might be what he's thinking? Because I agree with you. Why, huh. What are they doing? But I think that's like, what he's thinking. This, so you see this, this chart from Kathy Jones from Charles Schwab about the change in Fed fund rates per cycle. Don't you think that them doing this and being so tough instead of like having a little humility, they're, they're going to have to cut rates in like six to 12 months? Pro- like I think that's a look non-zero the, look, chance look, right now. Look at the next chart. So that's a phenomenal chart. We're looking at the pace of rate hikes. So BlackRock created this too. Um, the BlackRock chart includes 1980. The, pri- the previous one doesn't. So 1980. So we're seeing what we're what for people that aren't watching on YouTube, and actually maybe for people that aren't watching on YouTube, maybe now's a good time to sh- to. S- what are we doing today, Ben? What are we doing today? Nice. We'll get to it. Okay. Um. So 1980 was the steepest increase in interest rates. Paul Volcker broke the economy and crushed re- crushed uh, inflation. And in hindsight, is viewed as a hero for doing what he did. Uh, I don't think the market will, even with the benefit of hindsight, view uh, Powell. No, he's gonna be he's gonna break the mortgage, the housing market, and he's gonna be viewed as a villain. I think from now and then in the future too. Because here's the thing: 1980, we had been dealing with inflation for like 15 years, above average inflation. We've now been dealing with it for 18 months, and the, the circumstances this time are completely different from what they were in the 70s. There was no pandemic back then. There was no supply chain issues. There was none of that stuff going on. So. I don't know. I think there's probably too much information too. So if if you look at the the Fed's projections, I, I pulled these up, and so this is from September 2020. They predicted that by 2023, the unemployment rate would be at four percent, right? Which at the time, job recoveries in the past have been very slow. So that even that was a pretty fast job recovery. They were saying we're going to go from like 7.6 percent at the end of 2020 to four percent by 2023. We we were back under four percent by December 2021. So they were just a bit off. So now let's leap forward to June 2021, not that long ago. Their prediction for the Fed fund rate that they literally set themselves, these people set the interest rate themselves. They can't even predict the interest rate that they're going to set. They predicted it would be 0.6% by 2023. They've raised by 75 basis points the last two meetings. So they've now raised more than they thought it would be next year. So it's already at three and a quarter. They predicted it would stay 0.1% or zero through 2022. This is in 2021 they predicted this. This is a really good teachable moment. If you are, if you are listening to us and don't understand that forecasting econo- uh, the economy is absolutely not worth spending 30 seconds on, I don't know, what, what, you know what's going on. They have how many PhDs in the building? I mean, this is- Several this hundred, is the moment, and, and, the, and is, they, have no, they have no idea. And anchorman Brian Fantana says, maybe you should stop talking for a while, Brick. Maybe just say, listen, this is, a, this is an unprecedented economic environment. Why, why are we even putting these forecasts out anymore? Why don't we just take it as it comes and see what happens? And let's just be a little more humble. like Because them putting these forecasts out, because now the new forecast is going to be, well, longer run, the Fed funds rate is going to be back to 2.5%. So they're already saying they're going to cut at some point anyway. And that eventually, the, the stock market, you're right, they're worried about the stock market thinking, well, the Fed's going to cut eventually. That's because if things get worse, they are going to have to cut. 
And that, so why not just stay at like a 3% for a while and see what happens instead of going they're, they're, all the way to four and a half and then back to two? They're talking about two more 75s for uh, the rest of the year, which would take us to what's their rate, uh, year end, four, six, or something like that. Jeremy, okay, that so second th- 75 basis point is never going to happen. They're gonna, they'll cut before they do that, I think. I, I think that's how bad it's going to be if they let mortgage rates get to seven, 8%, basically. Well, mortgage rates are at 7 uh, basically. So I don't know if we could play this, but if we can, I want to play Jeremy Siegel uh, absolutely go, going nuts on TV. I don't know that I've seen you this animated. You seem down. I am very angry upset. At- yes, I am. I am. I, I, I'm afraid it's like a pendulum. They were way too easy, as I've told you and many others through 2020, 2021. And now, oh my God, you know, we're going to be real tough guys until we crush the economy. I mean, that that is just to me absolutely um, poor monetary policy would be an understatement. I watched this live. I, I'm, I'm a CNBC, I have three screens in front of me on my desk, not to brag. And I have CNBC on one of them most days and on mute. And if I, I'll hit the unmute if I hear something coming on. And I, I watched Jeremy Siegel like flailing his hands in the air. And I didn't disagree with anything that he said. So, all right, uh, the New York Times tweeted, U.S. manufacturers have now added enough jobs to regain all that they shed during the pandemic and then some. Uh, Comedian, who I'm a fan of his comedy, Rob Delaney, quote tweeted, uh, not so fast, and he quoted the Fed. So this, for whatever reason, (laughs) for whatever reason, this was the week that hating the Fed went mainstream. Uh, Colin Roche tweeted, the U.S. is going to have a 7% mortgage rate soon. At record high prices, the math doesn't work on a 5% rate for most people. At 7%, the housing market comes to a screeching halt. So I don't know if we're at 6, 8, or we're, we're right there. So our friend uh, Economic uh, retweeted that and said, fun fact, for the Fed to make housing more affordable at 7% versus 2.5%, home prices would need to drop more than 40%. And uh, Jake said, it's amazing how quickly my view on Powell has turned. He is in a bad situation, no doubt, but he is seemingly intentionally going to break stuff that really should not intentionally be broken. Cullen said, same. I thought he handled COVID as well as he could have, but but this rate stance at this moment strikes me as super reckless. I am increasingly convinced he'll have to emergency cut at some point soon, and then he should promptly fire himself. So this was the week. Uh, this was the week that, that consensus was. I agree with both of our job. finance Twitter friends here. I, I agree with both of them. I give him a lot of credit for dealing with a tough situation in COVID, they obviously overstayed their welcome, and a lot of the problems that were created were not their doing. But I think, especially the housing market thing to me, letting mortgage rates get that high that fast, I think people are going to look back in, in decades ahead and go, what the hell were they thinking? This is this is ludicrous. So I don't know that you can hang your hat on this, but to me, there's, there's two potential bullish catalysts. One, the Fed blinks. And let's be honest, for them to blink, things are going to have to get much worse than they currently are. Right, so I don't think that you could say the Fed is going to blink anytime soon. Number two is uh, an inflation print coming in cooler than expected or less hot than expected. Uh, outside of that, the Fed has the Fed has changed their mind a million times in the last three years. That's I think that's kind of what I would bank on is the fact that they they can't even predict how they're going to feel in three months, let alone what the economy is going to do. Right? Do you do you see them? Do you see them saying, "All right, we've done enough damage"? I unfortunately. I think things would have to get materially worse. I don't think it's going to take much more for things to start breaking in the financial system, unfortunately. Well, when you I say think- breaking, because that's the thing that pundits are saying, and I guess I'm going to lump you in with that. What do you, what do you mean things break? What does that mean for I think they're. I think, they're, I think if they let mortgage rates get to 8%, the housing market is all but broken. I think it's, there's literally going to be – the construction industry is going to be done for, I think – there's going to be very. There's going to be no inventory on the market. People who have to buy houses are going to be just in a shitty, shitty position. I, I think if you break the housing market, you break the U.S. economy. And I think that is. Luckily, we're in a very good situation with the people who own their houses. So unfortunately, it's a lot for people who are not in that situation. That's what makes it tougher. But I think bringing the housing market to a basically a standstill and then trying to restart it again at some point, I think is is going to have like reverberations for years to come. And I think that's, it's a very bad idea. I think that's, that's the logical place where things quote break is the housing market. I think you're absolutely right. Connor Sen tweeted a few weeks back. We spoke about this. This was in on August 12th during the, the, what we know is now in fact a bear market rally. And people were saying, well, never had a bear market rally bounce this hard. He said, 
So it's fun that we can now say something that's never happened before is going to happen. Either we get inflation down from elevated levels without a recession, or a 50% plus retracement of a major bear market sell-off goes on to make new lows, so you have to decide which it is. And I feel like both of us picked the latter. I can't quite remember. Maybe you can go check the tape if you're I really think, curious. I think we, we said that a sell-off in the stock market is probably more, would be a higher probability event. Right. I, so I didn't think again, it just, just, fast, to, but. just to re-explain what happened, we had that, that uh, we had a bear market that bottomed, was it June 16th or July 16th? Then it was June 16th. And June then 16th. from there, the market had a very nice rally and more than half of those losses were made up in the rally. So prior to literally today, there had never been a bear market rally where we had 50% of the gains of the losses recouped and then made new lows and we just had that. You know what else? You know what, uh, uh, the two, actually a few incredible retracements. So all of the gains from pre-pandemic in the Dow Jones Industrial Average have been ripped away from us, all of them. Pr- which Price basis. Kind of makes sense. Can we just say like, all right, twenty pandemic never happened, like the the the, the, the decline, the recovery, the the Fed induced, Congress induced recovery never happened. Let's just let's just shake the etch of sketch and go back to where we were before all of this began. So yeah, if you look at the S and P, it's still up eighteen percent or so since the since the end of twenty nineteen. I think small caps are below. Uh, pr- they probably are. The Nasdaq is probably still above a little bit, but it's it's close. Uh, okay, so you're in Timmer said people are not throwing the towel yet. And I think that's that's what a lot of people are waiting for is like some capitulation moment. But add, and they want to see like this massive amount of selling, I think. So what is he he's saying that like actual flows have not been that negative? I think Eric Belchunas just tweeted this week. I wrote about it. Bond flows are actually worse than stock flows this year. There's more money that's f- flowed out of mutual funds and ETFs from bonds than from stocks, which actually kind of makes sense to me. Behaviorally, now, it makes sense uh, from yes. an investment rationale. It makes literally no so sense here's the backwards. Thing. Well, I'm making it sound really terrible right now, and the Fed is breaking stuff. The longer this goes on, the more long-term bullish I'm getting. Because here's the thing. So there's everyone dancing on the grave of a 60-40 portfolio right now because it's you know a traditional mix of stocks and bonds is getting hammered this year. It's one of the worst years ever for it. It's probably going to go down as, as like top five worst year ever for a 60-40 portfolio in the last 100 years. Here's the thing. You can get 4% in like short-term safe bonds right now. So from just a year ago, that is a an expected return base. That's, that's almost like a 1.8% increase in your expected return. Because if you take 40% of that 4%, it's like 1.5% to 2% basically you're getting. And a year ago, those, those short-term bonds were trading basically at 0%. So your expected returns have gone up almost 2% in the last year in bonds. You had to get some pain to get there. But uh, that that's a sunk cost. You can't. There's nothing you can do about those losses now. So I'm I'm getting more long term bullish the further this stuff goes on, and I, I think the fact that you can finally get some safe yield in your portfolio that you couldn't for years and decades, maybe over a decade pretty much that short term rates have been this high, I think if you think that's a bad thing, then you're not paying attention as an investor. This is a I think good I s- thing. I think I said last week that I was starting to get constructive, and I, I I'm pretty sure. At least I hope it says. I'm pretty sure I said I'm not calling a bottom because, but, but uh, if oh here's another potential catalyst, if Q3 earnings come in better than expected, that's another potential catalyst. Uh, but yes, Ben, you're right. If stocks fall another 15 percent from here, I will be outright giddy. Now I understand that it's not going to be fun, and potentially for people, uh, especially for people that have that no longer have income, that you know are in retirement, it's really really no fun. Uh, but to your point, finally, 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 for the last how many years, Ben, have, has the Fed been punishing savers? Yeah, right. Those, this is a, you this can this earn is a real more money in real, short-term, real short-term government short-term government bonds, corporates, high yield now, uh, I bonds, all the so you can get cash account a little bit. You can get way more money than and, you ever could. And immunities, you get five to six percent tax equivalent, so you could actually generate income to satisfy your needs if you're in retirement, which is which is a wonderful, wonderful no, I can't, with, thing. With I don't, all this stuff I don't going, think. I don't think people are going to capitulate. Like there obviously, there obviously is a point at which, yes, people probably will throw in the towel, but I don't know if that's down 35%, if it's down 40%. There is a, everyone has a pain point where they say, I can't take it anymore, but absent like a really violent sell-off, um, and I'm almost afraid to say this out loud, but I, you know, Ben, you've been talking about this over the past few years. I do think investors understand, um, that stocks go down sometimes a lot 
but ultimately they do recover and the recovery might not happen as quickly as you like. You know, there's no set schedule, but if you do hold on long enough, you, you will be, you will be made whole. This is, I can't tell if this is really bullish or really bearish. It has to be one of the two. And I don't know which one over the last year, the S and P is down like 17%. And this is with the fed raising rates. And then the fed now basically cheering the stock market to fall. So the fact that it is only over the last year down 70%, it feels like it should be way, I've said this before, it feels like it should be worse. And I can't tell if that's a good thing or a bad thing because people aren't throwing in the towel and capitulating. And is, is that a good thing because people are having more steady hands and they, they think the Fed is probably bluffing? Or is it a bad thing that there's more pain ahead? I honestly don't know. But again, the further this is prolonged, because this is this is a, a downturn of our own making. This is not like we have some financial calamity, like the system is is messed up and we're having like a reckoning here. A lot of this is we're, we've done this to ourselves, right? Every, get, every part of the, Let me ask you this. Do we get new highs in the, in the S&P 500 in 2023? That's tough. How many t- <laughs> because you're counting on like the Fed cutting rates or, but are they cutting rates because we're, they put through us into recession? The, the, my forecasting abilities right now are, are nil. How about, how about that? Because okay, of where well, we are. Not, all right, listen, well, I'll take a st- I, I say, I'll say no. If you had to, if you had to, if you, I would say no new highs in 2023. Obviously, and if, love to if be that wrong. happens, that if you're a, a, a net saver, you want this thing to be prolonged. You want to continue saving at lower prices and having more volatility. Ah, uh, yes. That's a, so that's, that's the, a good so thing. that's that's the other part of it that I, I'm glad you said that. For those of us not in retirement that are contributing every two weeks to your 401k and maybe even to a brokerage account aside, this is a beautiful thing. I know it doesn't feel that way, um, but lower for longer is better for your future self. I, I think that's pretty incontrovertible. Uh, ben, you and made, one other you thing made... for young people, what's the number one question we've received on Animal Spirits over the last five years? Where Leverage? do I put my cash when I'm saving for a down payment? Oh, uh, cash, yeah, yeah. Yes. You finally have somewhere to put that, because everyone would always say, this, this is terrible. I'm saving for a down payment and I have nowhere to put the money to earn any yield. Now you can. True. Unfortunately, True. your down payment is going to be five times higher. Well, jo- because, Josh, uh, Josh just wrote about this. What is a better investing environment for people that have a time horizon beyond three weeks? Is it today or is it 2021 when there was just massive euphoria, stocks went up every day, bond, bond uh, interest rates were, were less than 1%. I mean, it's not even close. Right. This right. is this is this is the pain this is before. It. This is what okay. you want. Uh, zero coupon bonds, Ben, <laughs> got cut in half. Jeez. So we spoke about things breaking. Um, TLT, which I, has I, a longer track record. I looked record. at this. So leading up to March 2020, zero coupon bonds in the previous 12 months, the trailing 12 months through March 2020, were up 65. percent Yeah, it was a meme. It was a meme bond. They were they were but they it, were flying it, in both directions now. Yeah. So TLT has been around since 2003. That's uh, 20 year plus long term bonds. It's down 37.5% from its high. Jim Bianco shows a crazy chart looking at the, gl- the, the global aggregate bond index. This is off the charts. We've never seen anything like this. And I think part of the fear is that you don't want to see disorderliness. I know that's not a word in, in, the, in the bond market. Now, to the extent that there is good news in here, and maybe I'm grasping, companies gorged themselves on yeah. debt in 2020 and 2021. I don't remember how much Carnival raised. Was it a billion dollars? Uh, but companies absolutely are have 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 a runway. Depending on how how bad things get for how long, you know, we'll we'll see. But like companies have a lot of cash on their balance sheet, so it's not like everybody is refinancing at these current rates. Now, of course, some companies do not have the luxury of being able to tap the public markets and are not able to get you know multiple years worth of bonds. They do have you know rolling credit facilities, so those companies are going to be certainly in some pain. Um, ben, the average target date fund return year to date. Jeffrey Patak uh, just showed it doesn't matter whether you're 2030 or 2080 or whatever. Uh, there's pain, 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 pain. Counterpoint. These are retirement vehicles. People are saving every two weeks, every four weeks, every week. Money's going in at lower prices, right? If you're a target date investor and it's in your 401k and you have decades ahead of you, keep plowing money in there. Ben, I said something on the podcast uh, two weeks ago that was not English. I think I said, or, or was not logical. I think I said that U.S. small cap stocks are less levered to the U.S. economy than large How do you caps. Say that? Is, did you say it in, did you say it in Spanish or which is <laughs> which is factually incorrect? What I meant was the stock prices are yeah. not as sensitive to the to U.S. economy as you might think, even though the businesses certainly are. Stocks I think and businesses. I asked the question. 
shouldn't small caps do better when the dollar is being strong? Yes. Right? Stocks and businesses, of course, are not always the same thing. So, so friend of the show, Sam Rose, sent us this from Bank of America, and they base the TLDR is mixed performance of small stocks versus large stocks during U.S. dollar strength. You would think U.S. dollar strength, which is bad for companies that are have a large large portion of their uh, sales from overseas, they have to convert to the dollar. It obviously makes exports less attractive. Um, it doesn't, it's not that clean. It's not that clean. I guess, the, I guess the point would be when things are going bad, usually the dollar is doing good. And when things are going bad, small caps are going to do worse. So that, that trumps any, that makes sense. Okay. It's a special day here on Animal Spirits. Uh, if you're not watching on YouTube, Michael and I are both wearing our Tropical Brothers shirts. Uh, today's show is sponsored by Tropical Brothers. We did it, Michael. We, we wore them down. Bucket, bucket I, list. I, I, yes. I got to tell a story. So I don't know. I was in the I was in the mood for a new shirt, and I, I think Instagram might have gotten me. I can't remember where I found that the uh, the ad a few years ago. By the way, is that, a new this, shirt, is that a new Tropical Brothers shirt that you're wearing? Because, for, again, for people that are just listening, here's what's going on. You've got the material that's to die for. It's the most comfortable shirt I've ever worn in my life. Um and Ben's shirt is it's it's a teal blue. There's there's a there's pineapples on it, and the pineapple is wearing glass sunglasses. Am I right? Is that pineapple wearing sunglasses? Yeah, with some flamingos on here. It, you're right. It's it's very comfy. So I got one of these shirts and I tried it out. And I think the first time I wore it was like a Fourth of July parade. And I decided, you know what? It's it's we're celebrating America's birthday. I'm gonna go out with a bang and I'm gonna wear my my flowered Tropical Brothers shirt. And I have never got more compliments for an article of clothing in my life as I did that day. I had people stopping me going. I love that shirt. That is amazing. Men, women, people, everyone was saying, I love your shirt. So I, we wore them. To, we've been wearing them a little bit. I, I got you on this a little bit ago. And we wore them to Future Proof. And I don't know how many people at Future Proof came up to me and go, oh, I wish I would have had one of those. It looks so comfortable. It's breathable. It's light. They also have polo shirts. It's great. And so what we're doing here for our wait, listeners. Wait, can I, can I tell one more story to, that that mm -hmm. totally echoes your experience. I think it's universal. It is a showstopper. It is a conversation starter. I'm not a, I can't start small talk. So I, I did a fourth, uh, I don't know if it was a summer. It was not a fourth of July. It was a summer party at a person's house. I don't know. It's people in the neighborhood that I don't really know anybody. And I wore one of these shirts and Robin, my wife was like, you're not, no, no, no. You're not embarrassing me. Take that shirt off right now. I said, absolutely not. Not up for discussion. I, not only am I wearing the shirt, well, that's it. I am wearing. I did wear the shirt. Uh, but we walk in, and immediately two people are like, "I love that shirt." And, my, yes. and Robin, like, she rolled her eyes. But listen, <laughs> that's that's what it does. It opens up doors. If you're not if you're not a good small talker, this shirt does the talking for you. Yes, it does. Yeah, I, I wore you down. I said you have to get them. You got it. You loved it. So they they, they have swimsuits. They have quarter zips. They have these button-down Hawaiian shirts. And, they have polos. And, and, for, for, well, listen, okay, so here's the deal. Obviously, depending on what it, what uh, part of the country you're in, if you're in California, you can rock this 12 months of the year. Unfortunately, Northeasterners, Midwesterners, the, it's, it's going to get cold. The, the, the winter is coming. You know what they have? They've got, they've got hoodies. Well, not hoodies. They've got like long sleeve. Long sleeve uh, quarter zips, yeah. Quarter zips. There we go. Yeah, and so, but you want to stock up on your Hawaiian shirts now, so. Yeah, for next year, code, for the it's, beach. It's, they got a fall sale, Animal 20. You get 20% off. Anything. So you want to you want to load up for your your trip to Florida in December, January, when you're going to Disney World, or your <laughs> spring break trip next year, right? Or your trip to Future Proof next year. We went to Future Proof, and I'd say a dozen people in the crowd were wearing Tropical Brothers shirts. There was a guy in the crowd wearing the same exact shirt as me. It was awesome. Uh, anyway, My closet is full you, of these things. Thank you to Tropical Bros. This was this was really our Super Bowl, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a proud day here. Um. All right, so where are we going next, Ben? Interest rates, what, what, what do you got to say? What, what were you wrong about? Okay, here's something I was wrong about. So in terms of interest rates, so Yahoo Finance had a piece that said a new analysis from the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget predicts that this week's rate hike alone led $2.1 trillion to government deficits over the next decade, and that's on top of the series of hikes we've already had this year. And so I think one of the things that, I talked about, and maybe we did on the show too, is we thought there would probably be a cap on interest rates at some point because if you raised interest rates too high, we've added on all this debt, not only over the decades, but just since the pandemic, we added so much debt. I assumed there would be a cap on rates because the government would go, if we raise rates too high, it's going to eat up the majority of our budget for interest expense. And now they've blown through that. Maybe they think inflation eating to that debt gives them some breathing room, but I, I probably underestimated how bad people would hate inflation. 
and we already know people hate government debt, but apparently people hate hate inflation even worse. So I I guess I'm surprised interest rates have been able to get this high because eventually the government's going to go. This is unsustainable. We can't we can't fund ourselves because interest rates are too high. Talk about people hating inflation. We we we're getting emails from from older listeners who think that we don't understand the psychological damage. And listen, okay, fair enough. I, I we weren't alive in the 1970s, so I think I think maybe that's true. I also got debt wrong, interest rates wrong, but for for a different reason, Ben. I thought obviously if if you told me that inflation was going to be 9%, maybe I would have changed my mind, but I I definitely thought that um I definitely thought that demographics and the demand for anything yielding above 2%, I thought there would there would just be puddles of money rushing in to buy a 3% 10 year turns out that I was exactly wrong because not only right. is money rushing to buy it, people are freaking out because they have pa- not, pa- not paper losses. They have real losses, but uh, people are actually running the opposite direction. So well, I could not, I could not have been these, more wrong. So retirees, pensions, insurance companies, all these places that have wanted to yield for years and they finally got it. And now they're, they're selling. So yeah, I, I think, I don't know, maybe four or 5% will be the level that, that does it for them. But it's, uh, yeah, I, I was probably wrong on that one too. It happens. Ben, you spoke earlier in the show about things breaking. Gavin Baker tweeted a chart from Morgan Stanley on the U.S. dollar year-over-year change. It says the U.S. dollar year-over-year change is at a level that usually leads to financial economic stress. So they look at the China devaluation and global recession. That was 2015. You probably remember that. Sovereign debt crisis in 2012, the GFC, the housing bubble. Now, I kind of wonder if dollar increases lead to global, global stress or if dollar increases follow. In other words, when things get bad, do people flock to the safe haven that is the dollar? Right. And maybe it's a combination of the two. It's a chicken or the egg. And maybe this the Fed shouldn't care about the global economy, but I think they should but because – it's possible the Fed is also making things 10 times worse for these other countries. Like the UK, the, the pound crashed this week to levels not seen, I guess, since 1776 or something. I don't know. I was going to buy a house in the English countryside this week for nine ninety nine and a <laughs> can of baked beans. But uh, it, it seems like the Fed is potentially, and again, this is not all the Fed's fault. This is, these countries made some terrible moves. But it sounds like what the Fed is doing is, is having reverberations by making the dollar stronger, making these other countries' economies way weaker. And they, you could see things be way worse in Europe than they are here, too. The Fed could be breaking Europe as well. Okay, Ben, my line of the sand has been breached. This is a tweet from exec underscore sum, which is, I guess, the newsletter by, from Lit Capital. Uh, so I went to Chipotle last week. They've got this new steak. It is called Garlic Guajilo. I don't know what Guajilo means, but I was intrigued. Looked good. Five a five dollar premium for that steak. Okay, so it was, it was nineteen dollars. So I said, no way, am I spending that? So I ended up getting a chicken bowl, a chicken uh, over salad because I'm trying to eat well, and it was fifteen dollars. Now, now I I did add avocado or guac, but still, fifteen bucks in this economy. Chipotle. So you get uh, you get free guac at Qdoba, not at Chipotle yet, which is surprising to me. Th- this is way higher than I pay for the start. I think my starting price for a chicken bowl is nine dollars, maybe eight fifty. So I think this is okay. this is a lot of New York too. But still, that that's the premium for that new steak. What is it? Some extra seasoning on the regular steak? That that seems like that's a sales tactic. Uh yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like it. All right, uh, Full Stack Economics had a great post, fourteen charts that explain inflation. Also, I just want to be let it known that you've you've given up on Chipotle like seven times throughout That's this not inflationary true. environment. That's not true. Every I th- threatened. I threatened. <laughs> my Every line time you say I'm giving up on your your line in the sand keeps moving though. That's why it's no, a line no, in the no. sand because you can cover it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, all right, so let's just go through a few charts that I thought were really. In this is from for- what Full Stack Economics. Uh, really, inf- I hold on. The word that I'm using for is escape my brain. Informatory is not a word. It's not even close to a word. <laughs> Informative? <laughs> Informative. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Informative. Informatory. Good grief. All right. All right. Uh, so what we're looking at is, is CPI, core CPI, and median CPI. And the reason why, it's, why this median CPI stands out is because it's not just one or two things. 
unfortunately, it is really everything. Right. It's not so, okay, so that includes food and energy or, or excludes food and energy, right? No, that's the red line. The median is just what you think it is. It's the median. Okay, but I'm saying if, if you exclude food and energy, it's, about the, it's at the same place. Yeah. So you, you can't just blame it on th- those things that are it's being affected by It's not just shelter or just gas or just food. It's everything. Right. Uh, unfortunately, I said earlier that maybe a catalyst could be lower inflation. However, they have this really nifty chart showing that official rent inflation stats lag behind private data. So they're looking at CPI and they're looking at apartment listings and Zillow pricing. And so what they're showing is that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, who calculates CPI, says rents rose by 6.8% over the last year. But private data from Zillow and apartment lists show much higher figures, 10 and 12% respectively. Zillow and apartment lists are tracking how much you'd have to pay if you signed a new lease today. Uh, In contrast, the BLS tracks how much the average renter actually pays. And because most renters have year-long leases with fixed rents, it takes about a year for an increase in rent to be felt across the rental market. So today's high spot rent means that the official shelter inflation rate is very likely to remain high for at least another year. So what does that mean for CPI? Rent is approximately 7%. So it's not an insignificant uh, percentage. Follow? Right. Yeah. Remember, we, I explained this last week on last week's show. Okay. Well, I wasn't, so I wasn't there. <laughs> All right. Uh, lastly, we've been talking, or the, maybe the common narrative is that the Fed can't fix supply, right? It was supply chains. What they can do is go after demand, which obviously interest rates are a blunt tool, but actually those look like a hammer and it seems to be working. But they're showing a chart that showing that imports are up significantly since the pandemic. Quote, if the high prices of 2021 were caused by supply chain problems, we'd expect to see 2021 imports below 2019 levels. But in reality, imports over the last two years have averaged about 18% above the pre-pandemic norm. This suggests that the root cause of America's supply chain problems is that people have a lot of money and are buying stuff at an unprecedented pace. Ben, your thoughts? So people are still buying. We, we like to consume stuff. Is that it? People are still buying stuff? Yeah. I, I, again, I think that people were blaming. It's a demand thing. People were blaming supply, but it really was demand all along. And yes, d- the, there were both. supply chain issues, but it was caused. Demand shocks caused supply shocks. So you, you did a, uh, you did a, I agree with that. You did a piece about some of the sub stacks that you, you subscribed to a few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago. This full stack economics from Tim Lee, he just wrote this piece about how he's a professional dad who leaned out to support his wife's career. He was a journalist at a bunch of different places, and his wife is a doctor, and she was working a lot. And he decided to take a step back, and he wrote a whole piece about this and the stuff that goes through it. It's, it's an awesome piece, and I, I highly recommend full stack economics. Uh, great sub stack. Okay. Um, agreed. Ben, I don't know if we spoke about this earlier, but lumber round tripped along with the Dow and crude oil, which is now negative. You remember the date. memes in 2020 when it would, it would be like, take me on a date somewhere expensive and yes. people would photocopy someone in next to lumber at Home Depot? I do. I do. So lumber futures ended Monday at $410 per thousand board feet, which is down a third from a year ago and more than 70% from their peak. So I guess one of the things that's frustrating people is that it appears It appears that all of the real-time data that would indicate where inflation is going, it appears that the worst is behind us. Why doesn't the Fed see that? And they're not dumb. I'm sure they do see that. Again, if I had to just guess, I think that they've already done so much of the heavy lifting by destroying demand and bringing down prices. To stop when they're like on the five-yard line is something that they're probably risking. They don't want to be wrong like three times. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I think my problem is not taking like a little more middle ground here is that if and when they have to reverse course, if they go too far, then they're going to look like idiots again. For, right. Because I get it. you're going to see that you're going to see them hiking 75 basis points when inflation peaked and everyone's going to go, it was obvious inflation was peaking. Just give it some more time. Mm. And then they're going to look like idiots again. I think that's the problem everyone's having is that we're all seeing this economic data in real time. I don't envy the situation that they're in. But what if, what if, what if, what if Jay Powell said, you know what? Okay. Um, listen, 
things things are deteriorating fast than we thought. Mission accomplished. We're doing what you know. It's having the intended purpose. So we are going to potentially pause here, and we're going to give it a few months. What if he said that, and the market just took off, and credit spreads, even though they're pretty, you know, they're not like blowing out. What if well, that the- collapsed? And what what if he's like. Oh, because the, pro- the here's what they could say. If, if things continue, we'll give it a couple months. And if things continue to stay hot for CPI, we're going to do our 75 or 100 basis point hike. And guess what? We care about employment and prices, not the stock market. Right? I know they're, like, the stock market is something they're gauging. The fact that they keep commenting on the stock market, I think that's the dumbest thing. I know that they've, they've always probably looked at it. And in 2018, they probably cut rates because the stock market was in a bear market. But the fact that they're letting the stock market drive the narrative, I think they brought this on themselves by saying we want the stock market to go down. They should say we care about employment and prices. That's our job, not the, not caring what the stock market does. Okay, someone sent me this today. My local credit union, Lake Michigan Credit Union, where I actually have my mortgage, 30-year fix. They, this is as of September 26th. They are quoting 7.46%. Now, they're always a little Oof. high. They're always about 25 to 50 basis points high, which seems crazy for a credit union. They're at 7.5%. How many, how many mortgages could they be? Their loan department has to, they have to have like tumbleweeds going through it at this point. Yeah. This, this I can't even really imagine. Tough. This is really tough. Actually, here's, here's one thing that I'm, that I'm open to change my mind on. Uh, as interest rates were rising, had been rising, Remember, didn't Ben Miller from Fundwise say like 7% would be – what was his line in the sand? I he think it might have been 7 start, Did he say 7 or like – 6 or 7%. How, does, how do we get to 7%? So, that was like six months ago. Yeah, <laughs> like that. way back when, when interest rates were at 5%, my opinion was that um, there was a relatively high floor for how much home prices could drop given, again, the demographic trend of just – millennials needing to get into a house, right? Um, and so, yes, housing prices were going to have to come down to reflect interest rates. But that was what I was saying at 5%. At 7%, I don't agree with myself from six months ago because the math, to Colin's point, the math just doesn't work. Housing right. prices at 7% are going to need to come down materially. Not like 5%, but like materially. Here's maybe the silver lining. We've, I've talked in the past how we anchor to the highs and the lows. Maybe if rates, if mortgage rates somehow do go back down from seven to five, that five will seem way juicier now, whereas it seemed pretty high compared to three. That's true. So Lance Lambert tweeted, 6.7 mortgage rates plus these frothy home prices are a lot like 32% mortgage rates in the early 80s that uh, the boomers talk about. Hey, I paid 13%. Yeah, prices were a lot lower back then. So I feel like this is this is that seven and a half percent mortgage rates with houses up fifty percent in the last three years. It's brutal. That, that's it's the brutal. equivalent of like fifteen percent mortgage rates. Yeah, it's it is. Brutal. It does. It does. It, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And I I feel big time for people that are in this unenviable situation. Um, Mike Simonson has these charts: the percent of properties with recent price reductions. And yes, we are higher now. These charts are very seasonal. Um, we are higher than we have been at any point since twenty sixteen at this part of the year. So 41% of all listed houses have had a price cut. I feel like that number is going to go significantly higher through the end of the year. And the problem is year. that that's a percentage of a smaller amount of houses for sale. That's, that's what the problem is, is that the number of houses that are for sale is so much smaller than it was in the past that even if you're getting price reductions, there's still not enough houses for, for people to get out and buy if they wanted to, unfortunately. Like the, the inventory is, levels are still so low. The New York Times had this piece about the death of the starter home, which we've talked to bef- talked about before. It was interesting, and they talked about how uh, only 8% of new single-family homes today are 1,400 square feet or less. In the 1940s, it was nearly 70%. And they show, we've talked about this, like the, the typical home has gone from, the average has gone from like 1,200 square feet to 2,200. And the number of people there, like the average used to be like th- four people per household. Now it's two and a half or something. And they make the case in this article that a lot of it is because there's so many rules and regulations for development that they, it just, it's not worth it for them to make a starter home anymore. A lot of these builders in the, in the piece were quoted as saying, we would build a starter home if we could. It, it's not economically feasible for us. I also wonder, though, how many, how many people just want bigger houses these days? How much is, is the demand Everyone? for starter homes? Don't you think that's part of it, too, that people don't want a smaller house anymore? Or am I making that up? Mm-hmm. 
No, I don't think you're making, I think, no, I don't think you're making that up. Moving stinks. And so, uh, no, I don't, I don't think you're making that up. Okay. We had a John Paulson sighting this week. Credit to John Paulson. So I just wrote a quick post about this, that it's a very short list of people that got a big call very right and then didn't like stick with that, right? Um, Particularly where they made their money. They typically go back to the scene of the crime. John Paulson said on the, was asked about the US housing market and he said this time is different. Now, Ben, how easy would it be for John Paulson to go to hit the road and say, you know what this is? This is uh, the big short 2.0. How many billions of dollars could he raise to put to work scaring people? But he basically said that, actually, let me just quote him. He said, the financial market, the banking system, and the housing market are much different today than in 06 and 07. The underlying quality of the mortgages today is far superior. You don't even have some prime mortgages in the market. And the FICO scores are very, very high. The average is like 760. Um, Then he went to talk about the banks. He said, today, the average bank is probably 9% equity. The systemically important banks are 11 to 12%. Uh, so almost three, almost between three and four times as much equity as before. So we're not at risk of a collapse today in the financial system like we were before. Yeah, it's true. Housing may be a little frothy. Um, but so I made this chart looking at the amount of mortgage originations in dollars as a percent of the total pie for people that have credit scores below 660. In 2007, that peaked at 26%. It's 5% today. Yeah, much better. And maybe that, again, that's part of the reason the Fed is probably saying, hey, we, we've got some slack here. We can go to town. But I just, I don't know why you want to rock the boat if things are going well in some of these places. Just because you they're trying to crash. They're, tr- they're trying to crash the boat. I know. All right. So I, I've, I don't know what I was looking for, some old blog post last week. And I found a, a piece of life advice from a, a viewer of our show in October 2020. They're talking about Howard Marks and Ray Dalio and, and understanding the cycles. And this person was saying that his fiance was getting tired of waiting and she was demanding a better housing situation. He wanted to keep renting. She wanted to buy. And he was saying, I've read all the Howard Marks. I've read the Ray Dalio. I know that economics are working cycles. I'm waiting for a huge down cycle and then I'm going to buy a housing. I remember remember this email. I think national housing prices are up like 40% since this email came in. And it was just, it was just bizarre to read this with a couple of years of knowing what happened. Obviously at the time, who, who the hell knew housing prices were going to do what they did. But I think this is one of the reasons that you just, you don't take financial advice from billionaires for as, as intelligent as they sound. Did you listen to Ray Dalio with Ryan Rossillo on his podcast? Not yet. He's, he's, he's very bearish on America at this point. And I was reading it and he sounded very intelligent. His reasons made sense. And I wrote a piece three weeks ago saying why well, I'm still bullish on America. I, I think at a certain point, I, I think you can become too smart as a as a person with too much success. And I think can listening we, to those people as a normal person is not helpful. Can we also make the obvious point, maybe not obvious to the listeners, but it's obvious to us. It takes very little skill um, to scare people, right? Like right. to recite all of the reasons to be bearish, it's not impressive. We know. No. And it's, it's well, very easy right now to cite bearish reasons. And that's the thing. The people who are very negative and who have been negative for the last six to 12 months, those people are never going to tell you when to get back in. They're going to be the ones who are going to be beating the drum on, no, 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 inflation's really higher. When things do get better and they will get better, those people are not going to get you back in. And guess, guess how, how black things are going to look at the bottom? Sentiment-wise, news-wise, like technicals, like things are going to look like they're going to zero before the bottom, right? Well, just and go so- back to the first 15 minutes of this podcast. Everything we said sounded awful. And that's the kind of stuff that you almost want to hear to be, be a little more optimistic about the future without knowing what's going to happen in the next few months, I guess. So it is now 1236 and we are at the lows of the day. Stock market rolled over. What do they call Stock- that in technical analysis terms? St- this chart looks like crap. Is that what it's called? <laughs> uh, well, listen, so maybe oversimplify things and sometimes it's it's... It, that's what you want to do. The stock market is in a downtrend, and it has been, and it has been for. Uh, hang on. One sec. No, I don't want to just walk bust in on the podcast. Well, what do you? Well, what do you think you're doing when We're you're like doing this? 
Survey of the week from friend of the show, Ryan Dietrich. I feel like, he, I don't know, I don't pay attention to this whoa, stuff Whoa, whoa, much. whoa, is, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not the survey of the week. I no? know technically it is literally a survey, but we, we, we laugh at it's surveys of the week. our survey of the week. Okay. <laughs> All right. From the AI bears is above 60% for only the fifth time in history. This is like the survey where they ask people, are you bullish or bearish? 60% for the fifth time in history. Uh, and he's showing this tends to happen when things are really bad in the market, right? Is mm-hmm. that the idea? Yes. People probably, if you're, that's, you should be bearish right now if, if you're look at, looking around, right? Like that's not surprising that people are very bearish. Yeah, so, so, so these, are, these, are, these are good signals for long-term, like over the next year, three years, these, you know, obvi- obvi- I know it sounds, obviously you want to be a buyer when people are very bearish, right? However, this is completely useless garbage in the short term. So both things can be true. Longer term, yes, when people are, are pessimistic. Uh, shorter term, like, I don't, I'm not saying that we're going to crash, but crashes do tend to happen when everyone is bearish, when everyone is on one side of the boat. That's fair. Could we go down? Yes. Here's the thing. My, I guess I, my point is, my point is like negative sentiment in a bear market does not get me excited in the short term. You know thing. what I mean? Th- this, is, this is not 2008 by any means, but I do not, I do not have regrets about buying stocks in October of 2018 after stocks and stocks fell another 30 or 40% from there. Like I look back on that, those purchases in the fall of 2008 and I'm still glad I made those, even though they were way early. I think, I think you, you maybe need to be, if you're, if you're trying to bottom fish for individual stocks, please use a stop loss. Unless you're like trying to, you know, invest for a multi-year time horizon. That's different. If you're trying to catch stocks for a trade, you have to use a stop. If you're trying to buy like index funds on the way down, keep doing that. You will be rewarded exactly. eventually. Um, all right, tech IPOs. This is a chart. In 2021, we had 110 IP- tech IPOs. They raised $73 billion. In 2022, there has been one. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> really? Okay. Did we speak about Klarna layoffs? We must have. They no. just announced a fresh oh, round of layoffs. Okay, less than a month after the CEO said that, that they were done cutting. Just kidding. That, that's why you do, I think in these kind of times, I, I remember, so I knew an advisor at Merrill Lynch in, in 2008, and he told us, listen, Merrill Lynch is an independent organization. We've been an independent organization forever, and they were bought by Bank of America like 10 days later. He's like, we are not going anywhere. We're staying here. I think in a crisis, you don't make any concrete promises to people. Right, you always leave yourself a little bit of wiggle room just in case. Mm-hmm. That's why you never say like this is the beginning or the end. Like leave yourself some wiggle room, especially if you're laying off huge swaths of your staff. Ben, I don't know if this is just like uh, if this is being blown out of proportion because I haven't. I, I'm not a frequent Airbnb stayer, but apparently Airbnb is making you like do chores and clean up. Do you know about this? <laughs> well, we stayed at Airbnb. Maybe it was a VRBO this summer. And there was like a binder saying, hey, here's all the stuff in the area. Here's this. And then it was like a whole list of things. Like when you leave, we want you to do this to the linens. We want to leave the towels here. Like there was a list of stuff they wanted you to do. So 55% of active listings charge a cleaning fee. On average, makes up less than 10% of the total. Well, 10% of the cost. That's so annoying. You don't want to clean up when you're done. Pretty high. That is, that, um, that is the worst part is when you, you see the price of it, then you click and see what the actual price is. Yeah, it's, it's annoying. way higher. So here, so here it is. The cleaning fee across all U.S. properties averaged one hundred forty-three dollars as of June thirtieth, a forty-four percent increase from five years ago. That's a lot. They char- wait. Hang on. They charge one hundred forty-three dollars to clean. That doesn't mean. What do you pay? Your, okay. What do you pay for your cleaning service at home? That's not that. That doesn't seem that egregious to me. I don't pay when you go to a hotel. <laughs> you don't make the bed when you go to a hotel. But the, it, so they you're saying that should it. just. That should be part of the, that bake should be, it in. That should be baked bake in. Bake it in. But here, yeah, here's that's fair. here's a uh, the coup de gras. I haven't used that term in a while. So when Airbnb came public, it had a significantly larger market cap than Hyatt, Hilton, and Marriott combined. Okay. Needless to say, that went the other way now. Interesting. Airbnb is now around sixty-five billion. And Hyatt, Hilton, and the Marriott are roughly 80. I think if I'm betting on the future, I'm still taking Airbnb over those three places. Do you think that there's any differentiation between Hyatt, Hilton, and Marriott? 
Yeah, it's no cleaning fees. Okay. I, I still might lean towards Airbnb there. It's not like a slam dunk, but I, I might lean that no, way. No, for long term, for long term stays, you're going Airbnb all day long. Yeah. All right. Uh, oh, wait. Before, get to before we do that, can I just ask okay. a question? I was thinking about this. So we spoke briefly last week or uh, about uh, our kids playing sports. Do you use the Game Changer app? No, what's that? Okay, so the Game Changer app tells you where the games are. That's how parents communicate via text, if there's a change or this or that. How, well, what, what do you do? Like if, if there's a scheduling change or how do you communicate with the coaches? Yeah. I go wherever my wife tells me to go. I don't. I've <laughs> okay. So not, your wife probably has, your wife probably has a game changer. Right? My question is, how did parents do it prior to a cell phone? Was it like a great okay? So you call this person, this person, this person. I'll call that person, that person, that person, and she'll call that person, that person. Like, how did everyone get on the same page? I kind of feel like nothing got canceled in the past. It was just we're setting this time in stone, <laughs> and it's not going to change no matter what. Like plans that's, didn't that's, get canceled. <laughs> that's probably right. That's probably right. <sighs> yeah. Uh, I still haven't figured out how to do, you talk about small talk at a party. Maybe I need to start wearing my tropical brother's shirts to the games. I, I can't do the small talk with the parents. Oh, it's, it's tough. I, okay. I'm not, you, listen, you know I'm not great happens? at it. I'm, pro- I'm probably better than you, but I'm not great. Here's the thing. I hear this a lot at the soccer games. Uh, parents complaining about how busy they are. So Mondays we have soccer practice. Tuesdays is gymnastics. Thursdays is violin class, and then and they talk about how busy their weeks are with their kids. And I want to be like, listen, we're all dealing with the same thing here. Our mm. kids are busy too. Guess what? Who signed up? Who signed them up for that stuff? You did. No <laughs> complaining allowed. Sorry. This is what you signed up for. All right. Y- you've been talking to me about industry, and I've been a little behind you. And I've heard a lot of my TV people say that industry is like one of the best shows on TV right now. I thought season two was good. I take umbrage with the fact that people are saying it's one of the best shows on TV. I, I thought season one was better than season two. I have a few nit, nits to pick, and I'm only saying this because I hold it to a high standard. Wait, hang on, if hang I'm, on. You can't, you can't, all right, go ahead, go ahead. I, I liked the second don't, season. Don't, no spoilers, no spoilers. No spoilers. I, the, my only thing is I wasn't, I liked the ending. I wasn't a fan of the Duplass brother as a hedge fund manager. I thought he was completely unrealistic. I liked him in oh, the transparent he played, show. He played, he played Bill Ackman. I agree. He wasn't, he wasn't good. I that's, he a, was, that's, a, that's a sort of a tricky part. Here's my question. Would you trade one character from industry for someone on Succession? I would not make, if I was a general manager of a TV show, I would not trade one character from Succession in the top I think, 10 I, for any I character Har- on industry. I think Harper, Harper is phenomenal. I think she's the most unlikable character on TV right now. And they did that on purpose. But like, here's the problem. There's no... There's no redeeming qualities, and that's the same thing in Succession. None of those people are redeemable, but there's there's dark humor in Succession, whereas Industry has no humor. Yeah, that's so true. Think, well, it's, Brit- it's British. It's British. You're right. Industry's not funny. All right. One one of the th- I, I, again, I like the show. I'm just I'm picking nits. If I'm I'm giving the show a solid B, and Succession's an A plus. Okay, that's, that's my no, scale listen, here. I'm I'm with you. I'm I'm more of a B plus on Industry, but yeah, it's, it's not Succession. I don't right. I don't know who created Industry, but I'm guessing they're millennials because here's something I've. I've learned about millennials. They like going for shock value in their television and movies. Like Lena Dunham and girls would just put random nudity in there just to like shock you. Like, Ooh, look at how crazy I am. And I feel like they do that in industry a little bit. Do you remember the part in succession in the season one where Tom had his yes. bachelor party Yes, and I do a female that. exchanged some fluids with him back to himself? I do remember that. They just, they talk about it in succession. If that happened in industry, they would show it. Yes. 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 Anyway, I liked it, but it, it, I think it's a B instead of an A. All right, they did Margin Call on Rewatchables last week, and I re-listened to it, and it reminded me that we did, we used to do this, we did finance movie Rewatchables. We totally ripped off the Rewatchables. We called it a random totally. watch down Wall Street. And we, we, watched, we did Margin Call, and, and I think you should probably go listen to our version of it too because I think we did, we did a pretty good job. Much shorter too. But Margin Call to me is a way better movie than The Big Short or The Wolf of Wall Street. I think Margin I Call is one of the best finance movies ever made. I agree. I, I think the general audience would would disagree, but I think if you're for a finance f- person, for finance people, margin call is where it's at. They nail. I rewatched it. It's on Netflix. It's it it holds up really well still. Easily the best movie about the the financial crisis. I I, re- I told you I read that Robert Evans book, and he was good buddies with Jack Nicholson. So I'm working my way through Jack Nicholson. I watched Chinatown this week on HBO. That's always in the the discussion for like top hundred movies of all time. What did you? It's think? always way up the list. 
So here's what he said in his book. He said, I got the script for Chinatown. Everyone was really excited because it's a really well-known writer. And I read through the script and I had no idea what the hell was happening. So I read it again, front to, front to back. I still had no idea what the hell was happening. And then it came out and it was a huge hit. And he goes, I still don't really understand that one. And that's kind of the way I felt. It, I think it's a better performance by a young Jack Nicholson than it is a movie, a good movie. It was very hard to follow, but it was very well done. It was like... Like, the way that they shot it, the music they used was really good, but the movie itself, I wouldn't go back and rewatch it. Nicholson okay. was amazing in it. Now, uh, context, that movie's from 1974. And yes. you see and hear that it's on the top, whatever, 100 American movies of all time, and you've got a certain set of expectations that seeing it 50 years later... Maybe for sure. It was probably, it was, I'm sure it was groundbreaking at the time. You can tell, yes. like... Some of the choice, but yeah. Well, because there's there's a there's a there's a a bit of a shocking twist that just hits differently in 2022, right? You've you've seen that copied a million times. So I agree. I yeah, saw true. it. I'm probably not going to rewatch it. Um, he yeah. was good. My next one on my list is The Shining. I still never watched The Shining. Okay, I'm not that, a big that, horror guy like you. That aged well. I wouldn't. I'll report I, back I, next I, week. I wouldn't say that The Shining is horror. I guess I don't know what other genre you would put it in, but it's not like gruesome. That really, is a great yeah, movie. Really that is, that, it's All more, right. yeah, that is a great movie. All right, last week we watched on Friday night, we, it, brand new to theaters and to Peacock, we, which, by the way, did you know that Peacock has the Rotten Tomatoes scores if you hit pause, and it shows the Rotten Tomatoes score on the, on the TV? Pretty cool. I don't know if you're a Peacock subscriber. They had this movie called Vengeance by BJ Novak. He was Ryan on The Office, which I don't think you ever watched still for some reason. Nope. Which is a huge hole in your TV repertoire. And he wrote and directed, so I always get a get a premium for writing, directing, starring in the same movie. I think that's just, I can't imagine how talented you have to be to do that. He was in it. Ashton Kutcher was in actually a good one. And it's not a Michael movie because it's a coming of age thing, but it's also a lot of social commentary. And it was pretty funny, and I liked it. That Boyd Holbrook guy from Nar Narcos was in it. Pretty good movie. Did you? Like a did you, six, seven. Did you listen to uh, um, a two part of Rewatchables uh, on Boogie Nights? Not yet, but okay. I have a theory about Boogie Nights before listening. It's, the it's one of the best half movies ever made. Like, there's some movies that the only half three of quarters, is good. Three quarters, three okay. quarters. Boogie Nights, Talented Mr. Ripley, and The Wedding Crashers are all good movies that are good for, like, 65% of them, and then they tail off at the end. Oh, okay, I, I, I disagree with Talented Mr. Ripley. I, I, I love that. Wait, Wedding okay. Crashers was, 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 was 15 minutes too long, but uh, wait, what were we talking about? What I, what I, I, I lost the plot. What, what were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> the one I saw on oh, Peacock. Oh, uh, uh, Boogie Nights. No, Boogie Nights. Okay. So, uh, listen, can't take it away from PTA. As much as I don't like a lot of his other movies, Boogie Nights is easily uh, in my top ten of all time. Well, probably eh, one of the close. Probably one of the greatest casts of all time as well. The cast in that movie is amazing. All right, your turn. So I bailed on Lord of the Rings. How many episodes I, did I, you make it? I think I gave it three and it's boring. It's confusing. Nothing's really happening. And I'm just out. If, if, if I hear that it gets good, I'll pick it back up. But there's too, much, too many other good things going on. House of the Dragon. I really, I'm really enjoying. What do you think uh, about the skip ahead? I'm still I'm okay with it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to okay trust them, but it's, it's a little weird to happen well, in did, season. Did, did uh, I, it didn't skip a beat for me. Did you watch the recent episode? Yeah. Yeah, I was totally fine with it. Um, Big I, I, John, I, I, it's it's already yeah. confusing enough. The characters and stuff, it's just adding another element of confusion. But I'm I'm still on board. So for fans, or what are your thoughts? Uh, Chart on John gave me a recommendation. This movie is called The Raid, and it is that sounds like a Michael movie. Oh, oh, you're not kidding. It is extreme action slash violence. And here's the movie. You know what this movie is? You ever see the platform on Netflix? where they just descend lower and lower and lower. It's like social commentary. Oh, yeah. This yeah. is the platform in reverse where they have to go. There's like, uh, there's, uh, there's a gangster that they're trying to get and he's got all his henchmen and they're trying to go up the building to get him. And it's basically working, this guy working his way through all of the henchmen. It, it's, a, it's really like a Kung Fu movie ultimately with extreme violence. It is a violent Kung Fu movie. And did I like it? I loved it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise there. <laughs> the raid. All right. All right. We still got to talk about your Michael Batnick net worth thing here. Uh, we'll do that next week. We're already running long. Okay. No more recommendations? 
No more recommendations. Right. Uh, thank Ever. you. Thank you to Tropical Bros. Hey, we're, 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 listen, everyone listening, go buy a couple shirts because we're trying to talk them into doing an Animal Spirits shirt. I think we have to show them show them the money first. We need everyone to go buy a shirt. <laughs> we're, we're trying to get a Miami Vice shirt made. Remember, it's Animal 20. You can get 20% off swimsuits, Hawaiian shirts. I love the polos, Oh, wait a minute. Too. That's interesting. Are we trying to do a Miami Vice shirt? I thought we were trying to do like Animal Spirits-ish, but maybe Miami Vice is the shirt. I would like a Miami Vice shirt for Future Proof next year. That's my that's my oh, goal. Oh, there should be there should be uh, yes, cups little of Miami like, Vice drinks. Oh, of course, yes, of course. Come on. Of that's course. The, that's what I'm looking for. My a little Miami Vice drinks with oh, that's the, a the umbrella in it. Yeah, on a shirt. That's that's not even animal spirit white. specific. They should just have that in general. Exactly. That's going to be a classic shirt, and people are going to be wearing that at Future Proof next year. So Animal Twenty, go to tropicalbrothers.com. Uh, Send us an email, animalspiritspod at gmail.com, and we will see you next time.